In the early morning of July 30th, 2020, the Perseverance rover launched from Cape Canaveral, Florida, en route to planet Mars. Almost seven months and 300 million miles later, after a nail-biting descent, the spacecraft safely landed on the surface of the Red Planet. What is the focus of the Mars 2020 mission, and why is it a game changer for space exploration? Dr. Lucy Bertu is Professor of Space Systems Engineering at the University of Bristol. She teaches spacecraft design and researches technology for traveling to, exploring, and living on the planet Mars. Dr. Bertu, we're so excited to have you with us today. Thank you so much. Exploring Mars is no easy feat, and getting there with the spacecraft intact and operational is probably the biggest challenge. Why is Mars exploration so critically important? Yes, that's a really good question, uh, because it is relatively expensive to get to Mars, and we have had a lot of missions that go that failed. So why should we actually go? Um, I think there's probably three reasons to go to Mars at this time. Firstly, uh, the search for residual microbial life. So the search for life uh, elsewhere on other planets um, is, is at a point where we have instruments that can go and have a look at the moment. So that's really exciting. I think the second thing is to test out new technologies. And we have, for example, the Ingenuity, the little drone uh, helicopter that's on the Perseverance rover, for example, that's a new technology we're testing out. Uh, and then the, the third reason is probably to prepare for human exploration. Um, because Mars is our, our nearest, most habitable neighbour, uh, if we are going to put bases on other planets, uh, apart from the Moon, which is a kind of transit point uh, for us, then Mars is our ultimate goal, really. Truly an exciting time for space exploration. We're already seeing hundreds of images of the red planet, unlike anything we've ever seen before. And this mission's really just barely begun. Why is it considered such a game-changing mission? And what are its primary goals? So uh, as with all missions, we're building on the shoulders of giants. And uh, one of the, so Perseverance is really a kind of upgrade. I mean, if you, if you look an upgrade of a rover called Curiosity that uh, was launched a few years ago. And if um, Curiosity was like an SUV, then uh, Perseverance is like your super luxury uh, upgraded version of the SUV. And uh, it's got various things that are uh, an improvement. Um, one, so firstly, it's got a completely different suite of instruments that are doing some really exciting things. Um, as an engineer, I'm particularly excited with the, the things that are um, to do with its relative terrain navigation, for example. So that meant that we could zoom in and get to a particular part of Mars, the Gizero Crater, which is really exciting to explore, particularly with, re with respect to looking for signs of life. So that navigation enabled us to kind of navigate in close to a river delta, what used to be, it's not a river delta at the moment, but what we think used to be a river delta on Mars, and um, yeah, made it possible to land there safely. So that's just one of the, the differences between Perseverance and what we've done before. Well, it's the biggest rover and the heaviest rover to date, about the size of a compact car, which is interesting. So let's talk a little bit more about the payload, the technology, and that small four pound helicopter drone, which will begin testing the first powered flight on Mars. Yes, absolutely. Well, just starting with the instruments, there's a, a whole suite of really interesting instruments. There's a whole bunch of cameras, um, one with a kind of laser that's going to zap a rock and there'll be a little plasma cloud and then you can analyze the chemistry of the plasma cloud. So that's pretty cool. There's something called Sherlock with its little fellow Watson. Uh, nearby and they're doing some chemistry and uh, mineralogy so looking at all the different types of rocks on Mars that's really also important for the context for 
for the um, seeking for life. Um, there's an antenna that's going to look under the subsurface of Mars and find out, um, is it frozen? Is there kind of frozen water under there, which would be really interesting. Um, what else is there? There's um, MOXIE. Oh my goodness, MOXIE. My, one of my favorite experiments, uh, which is called in situ resource utilization, which just doesn't sound like anything. But what it's doing is really cool because it's trying to take the carbon dioxide in the Martian atmosphere, because Mars doesn't have an atmosphere like ours. It has a mainly carbon dioxide atmosphere. And if we can take that and just grab the oxygen out of that carbon dioxide, then maybe we can use that firstly for human exploration later on, which would be really um, good, but also for um, creating liquid oxygen as a propellant for rockets. Now that's really important um, for, for the mission that I'm involved with, which is a Mars sample return mission, where we have to build a rocket to get off the surface of Mars. And Ingenuity, which is this uh, wonderful helicopter, um, is very exciting for someone who teaches on an aerospace degree. So Ingenuity is really interesting because it um, we've never flown in these kind of conditions before. Uh, Mars's atmosphere is really thin and tenuous. Um, there's, there's not enough air to generate the lift, if you see what I mean. So uh, they've, it's the equivalent of flying really, really high with a helicopter uh, in, on the Earth. So uh, they've had to use a really different design to do that. And then they've had to test it in a vacuum chamber, which they put some carbon dioxide in, which is really fantastic. So it'll be really interesting to see if that works. They're going to fly it five times, I think. Um, and, they, and another really interesting thing is that they've got to do autonomous navigation. So it has to find its way itself because, of course, we've got this great this um, time lag, which we call latency. Um, between commanding, sending a signal from the Earth and it arriving on Mars of about 11 minutes varies. But um, so, so yeah, so when we, we say fly to the drone, then, then 11, meter, 11 minutes later it flies. So uh, it has to be able to navigate a little bit itself. It has to have a little brain and they're doing a bit of its thinking. Well, as you mentioned earlier, this mission is also going to pioneer the first Mars sample return effort, collecting rock and soil samples, which a joint NASA-European Space Agency campaign will bring back to Earth in the future. So where will those samples go and what will they potentially tell us? Yes, so, so what's exciting about this mission is it's going to um, grab some rock core samples, so it'll do a bit of coring it's got a kind of drill and it'll put those cores in some tubes and it'll store those tubes on the surface of mars for about well for about five years um, maybe a bit more because then there'll be two missions that are going to mars in order to set up this sample return one's gonna patiently wait in orbit so there'll be an orbiter that's going around mars just waiting and then there's another one that's going onto the surface of mars and it's got, got a, another little rover on it called a fetch rover and it's going to go and collect the samples those tubes and it's going to bring them back to the the lander thing then the lander is going to shoot off a rocket uh, into Mars orbit, meet up with that orbiter, which has been patiently waiting for it. And then that orbiter is going to bring the samples all the way back to the Earth. So that's really um, exciting because when we send a, a rover to Mars, um, we can't put on uh, as many instruments as we'd really like to do. And we have much more complex, larger, more powerful instruments on the Earth. So it's really it would be really good if we could bring some samples back from Mars and analyze them with our special Earth instruments, um, which are just a bit more powerful. So where will those samples go? And 
Is there potential? I mean, if there are ancient forms of life on Mars, will these samples potentially show it? Uh, we hope so. <laughs> Obviously, we're designing, so it's really interesting, we're designing um, everything on the basis of what we understand of what life is. But of course, life could be all sorts of things. So when, when we were talking about how to design a containment facility for uh, where to put the samples when they arrive back on Earth, because we have to be very careful and responsible uh, about our containment of those samples, we have to not only make sure that we're not contaminating the samples, but also that they're not contaminating the area around them as well. But we're very good at biocontainment now, uh, thanks to a pandemic, but also uh, there is a lot of expertise around the world in biocontainment and always has been. Um, so those samples, they'll be um, kept within this uh, special Mars sample receiving facility. And uh, from there, they'll either be analyzed there in situ or they can be sent out very carefully around the world to the people who have the very specialized uh, equipment in order to analyze them and to find out uh, even more about whether there's uh, potential life on Mars. Well, each and every Mars mission relies on the mission before it and helps to prepare for the missions to follow. So you mentioned uh, possibilities of future missions. What future missions is Perseverance preparing for? Yes, so um, we tend to go through a sequence in space exploration. Um, we tend to start with the simplest mission, which is, uh, well, obviously just going into Earth orbit, but then the next one is to fly by a planet. Uh, then after that, we tend to try and orbit around a planet. Uh, then we want to land on the planet or the body. It might be a comet or an asteroid as well. Um, then we want to rove around on the planet. Uh, and then the next one, sample return. So that's definitely our, our, that's what Perseverance is preparing for, really, the sample return mission. And then after that, it's uh, human exploration, really. So that's when we start with our crewed missions. Uh, and then uh, it'll be building bases, hopefully, and commercialization, because that is our really our ultimate goal is for this industry to be self-sustaining and uh, for it to be financially worthwhile for companies to, to be doing space travel. Well, and I think it's much closer than we think the potential of humans on Mars. Is there a, a timeline, a date that space travelers, space explorers are looking at? Well, I think um, anyone who puts a preci precise date on it will, will be being optimistic. It's always good to have a target, but I think people are talking about the 2030s. Um, I, have, I have seen many... Um, many dates mentioned in the past that people have had to row back from a little bit. So I think uh, anything earlier than the 2030s would be optimistic, but that's not to say I wouldn't encourage people to go for it. Um, as long as it's done in a safe and responsible way and working with NASA. But I think a lot of the entrepreneurs in this area have realized that the value of that uh, of working with the big agencies who have, uh, you know, 50 years of experience and uh, they're doing that very closely. And I think the partnership is working really well now. Fascinating time. Dr. Bertu, we thank you so much for taking some time to share your expertise in this area and give us a look into the world of space and the possibilities that lie ahead. We really appreciate it. A great pleasure. Thank you, Sharon.